Let's crack on with our big interview tonight. Now, folks, there's been a lot of talk in recent weeks, hasn't there, with those local elections just happening, what, two weeks ago, whether Labour need to do better with the British Muslim community in order to guarantee a majority at the next election. Labour leader Sakir Starmer's position on the conflict in Gaza has led to a loss of support for the part, in part at least, among Muslims. And a campaign group was set up called The Muslim Vote, and it issued a list of 18 demands which it said Starmer had to meet in order to win back their supporters and voters. But can one campaign group really represent all four million of Britain's Muslims? And is there even such a thing as a monolithic block of Muslims who see everything exactly the same way? Well, Dr. Rakib Hassan, author of Beyond Grievance, What the Left Gets Wrong About Ethnic Minorities, wrote an article about this last week, and he joins us now. Good evening, Rakib. Rakib, can I start off just by getting you to explain your position and your stance on that question? Is there such a thing as the Muslim vote? Well, in my, in my view, Darren, uh, what we're talking about here is specifically is this campaign organisation, which is very vocal after the latest round of local and mayoral elections in England, called uh, the Muslim vote. And as you stated there, it listed 18 demands which were made to Sakir Starmer. We saw in those local elections uh, there were a loss of Labour councillors in Muslim heavy areas, especially across northern England. And many people, including myself, were very much of the view that that was because of Labour's positioning on the ongoing conflict in Gaza. But what was really interesting for me was that in these 18 demands, there was nothing on family policy. There was absolutely nothing on sanctity of life when it comes to abortion and euthanasia. And there's really, there's nothing about empowering faith-based civil society, which can do a great deal of good in our local communities. And what was really interesting with the Muslim vote, uh, there was one Friday morning, it was bemoaning Israel's participation in the Eurovision Song Contest. Mm. Now, Darren, as you know, I'm based in Luton. I can tell you that the Muslim elders, when they're attending Friday prayers, they don't have Israel's participation in the Eurovision Song Contest <laughs> in mind. So I really question how representative this campaign is when it comes to the four million Muslims that live in the UK. But there is, it is right to, to suggest statistically, right, there are what mm. they said the 770, uh, se there are 747 rather thousand people from one particular part of, of mm. Kashmir, for example, right? Mm. And if you consider that in the whole context of what, 700 and odd thousand people in Newcastle, if you exported all 747,000 people from Newcastle to abroad, you would expect them to have similar cultural values and therefore for vote the same in similar ways. Is that not a fair assessment? Uh, that, that, that is a fair assessment. I've mentioned that some of the points that I mentioned there, which weren't part of these 18 so-called demands, I think more constructive language would have been proposals, in my view. It sounded quite authoritarian, in my view. Yeah. Uh, there is that social conservatism which runs deep in many British Muslim communities. But I've always made the point that the British Muslim population on the whole is quite diverse in terms of religious denomination. Uh, ethnicity. Uh, and indeed, in, when you look at the recent data looking at British Muslims, one in 20 British Muslims actually belong to the white British mainstream, many converting to Islam. So I think the point that I made through my research is we need to get away from those views that even though on certain issues there may be much common ground between um, and among British Muslims, that we are actually talking about a fairly diverse population here. So before I, just before I bring everyone else in, I just want to really the question that we were just debating in the mm. first hour there is around uh, Gaza. And Benjamin made the point mm. of, you know, not everyone in Gaza will think the same way. So therefore, do we have to accept that? Yeah, of course, we should bring people from Gaza because not all of them are going to be supportive of Hamas. I think that there's been a great deal of talk about resettling uh, Gazans into yes. the UK. There have been a number of Labour politicians that have expressed their support for that. Yeah, I look at this signed a letter. In it, but I look at this a bit differently. I think for me, uh, in my view, that would be a dream for the Israeli government because ultimately this idea that you'd have these large-scale resettlement routes um, being organised in Western countries. Uh, I, I think the idea that if you're ultimately supportive of a Palestinian homeland, it's also quite bizarre 
to then suggest there should be large scale resettlement routes for Palestinians to be relocated to the UK and other parts of the West. So I think people need to strike a more coherent view in terms of how they see the ongoing conflict. All right. I'm just going to bring Paula in because, I, Paula, during the break, we were discussing whether or not you, you thought there was such a thing. Now, you do think there's such a thing. I do think. I think a lot of Muslims, it's almost like a, they're very pack like and brotherhood. Like for Christians, we don't all vote the same way. But I think when a lot of people go to pray like their Friday prayers, they're the sort of influence to do certain things. So, yeah, I, I do think, I do think so. And I feel like if someone that's pretty powerful in the mosque says, oh, all of you need to vote for this independent now because Labour haven't called for a ceasefire now or et cetera, et cetera, they will do as they're told, whereas Christians wouldn't do that. And a vicar wouldn't try to tell someone what way to vote. But in a mosque, I believe some people would, yes. I mean, Rakib, is that, is that your take on that? Well, I, I think the big trend in terms of Christianity in the UK is that it's, like it's been on a steadily downward trajectory. And, and I actually think, as a Muslim, I think that's a crying shame. Because I think with that declining Christian devotion, there's been a loss of family values in some ways. And, and I think that sense of community has been somewhat lost with that atomized liberalism and that declining Christian devotion. Now, there's no doubt that there are a very decent number of British Muslims who attend uh, places of worship very regularly. But actually, it, 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 the, the British Muslim population is quite diverse in that sense as well, in terms of uh, rates of uh, religious um, attendance um, at a place of worship and so, some actually have moved towards a more private model of actually praying um, at home. So I, th I think that in that sense that there's many British Muslims who are being directly instructed on how they should vote at the mosque. There's actually not that much evidence of that if truth be told. Okay. Um, good evening Dr Rakib, it's Benjamin Butterworth here. There's a story in today's paper that teachers are going to get new anti-blasphemy laws because we've had these problems in Batley, in Yorkshire and in Birmingham where Muslim community leaders have intimidated school teachers over things like LGBT issues and other social mm. questions and teachers have been left pretty afraid. What do you make of how we deal with those men, it's always men, who are trying to mm. assert that kind of authority in our country? I, I think, Bedford, firstly, there has to be much stronger and more robust guidance uh, on, on these kind of issues. And I think that parents absolutely have the right to raise questions in terms of what the kind of materials which are being presented to their children. That's absolutely no excuse to carry out intimidating protests right in front of schools. I, I, I've talked about there being a more constructive approach, uh, a more cooperative uh, approach when it comes to parents engaging more with School of Governors, the headmaster at a particular institution, and indeed teachers. But I think that culture of intimidation, I think that needs a robust law and order response. And there has to be an understanding as well among some British Muslims that mutual tolerance, it has to go both ways. Now, there may be, Benjamin, I'm sure that there's socially conservative attitudes within British Muslim communities that you may not necessarily agree with, but you may well tolerate them. Now, equally, we're a country where there are no blasphemy, uh, blasphemy laws. We have no mm. blasphemy laws in this country. And I think that that freedom to show dissent towards organized religion, that's yeah. something thing that is very much a hallmark of an advanced industrial democracy such as ours. I think the worry is that they're coming in by the back door, isn't it? Yeah, no, that's the mm. concern. But Dr Renee, I want to bring you in now. Hi, Ricky. Thanks for that. And I think Hi, I agree Renee. with you really on mass. Of course, there's no such thing as one Muslim. What worries, I think, some people is that there are pockets mm. across the country, be it Birmingham, be it George Galloway's area where we've just seen it mm. in action, where the Muslim vote can be pulled together to vote as one. And in the next election, those pockets are so big, or be them scattered, that could actually represent a major change in Parliament and what happens there. Do you see that happening? I, th I think that, uh, firstly, in terms of, I'm, I'm very familiar with Birmingham, so I know areas such as Spark Hill and Spark Brook, which have uh, a very high uh, Muslim populations, and indeed Small Heath uh, as well. Uh, I, th I think that more generally, when we're looking at those voting patterns, I'd make the point that the, the Rochdale by-election, 70% uh, of the constituents in, in, in Rochdale 
a non-Muslim. And I think that's something that was somewhat missing. There's no doubt that British Muslim voters helped George Galloway win that by-election. But in fact, there's actually quite, quite a few white British working class areas, quite pro-Brexit, protectionist, mm -hmm. and that combination of holding left-wing economics, but also being quite socially conservative, having strong family values. They also voted for George Galloway. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because the Labour Party doesn't really represent that, that kind of left-wing, socially conservative quadrant that you see on the political uh, um, compass. I think more generally, I think it's actually quite a good thing, to be fair, that there's this fraying of relations between the Labour Party and British Muslims. I think it's actually conceivable that Labour might win a reasonable parliamentary majority on much reduced British Muslim support. I think that's a possibility in the next general election. And I think, actually, if you see more um, independent candidates running in their local areas, and of course, it all depends on the views that they hold. But what I don't like is this idea that, for example, the Labour Party expects a high level of support among British Muslim yeah. voters. Yeah. Or there's British Muslim voters who automatically expect Labour just to um, hold their own views on domestic and foreign policy issues. I think that having a more vibrant and, and a more um, a diversity of political options in, in British politics, hopefully, would be a positive development. All right. We'll wrap it up there. Thank you very much, Dr. Rakib as Hassan, as ever. Now, folks... Uh... Yeah, can I say, I think we saw in these elections that there isn't a block vote because you saw the splintering of the way in which Muslim voters are choosing. You know, for example, George Galloway in Rochdale said that I'm going to wipe out Labour. 44 councillors were Labour and two were from his party. In Burnley, 10 councillors quit the Labour Party, Muslim councillors. Labour won them back at the elections. So I think this idea that... All the Muslim voters that were Labour have, have marched off just isn't true. Well, they'll, they'll march back if they're told to. And I, I feel like sometimes it's quite I effective behaviour as well. All right. Like, ben hasn't spoken on this. Know, where, where are you on what, what you've heard? Well, look, I, I was laughing to myself because there's been, of course, we saw that incident a few weeks back at the local elections where the green Muslim councillor was screaming al Akbar <laughs> at the count. Um, but I don't know if you guys saw, but Brighton, which is obviously infamous as being the LGBT capital of even Europe. Yeah, the mayor. 20 to 30 percent of Brightonians are gay or trans or whatever. They've just elected a Muslim mayor. Did any of you see that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Is yeah. that Turkey's voting for Christmas? Well, I do yes. think there's going to be a massive, you know, if you look at the stats in <laughs> London, for example, in, the in London, the support for LGBT equality, whatever that means, in, in the strictest terms, is is actually on a decline. And that can only be because of the rising, I think, the rising population of Muslims. Well, I think we could use London as an example, sorry, Benjamin, um, as an example of a bloc Muslim vote, because I think that that certainly has a big part to play in Sadiq getting a third term. Would you accept that? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> No, I wouldn't. I think, you know, because what it tries to, to claim is that somehow there's a lack of legitimacy to their decision making in the voting. And I think that's wrong. There's a lot of postal you know, votes. The man no, the household sends them all off. So but I think, uh, why couldn't go against the Muslim? I'm not saying that doesn't Muslims happen by vote. any means. And Tower Hamlets yeah. uh, in East London is a really problematic example of that. They don't have a Labour mayor. They have uh, a sort of a very strongly Muslim party, look for Rahman, that runs that area and, you know, doesn't have any any female councillors, for mm. example. I don't know about the mayor in Brighton. There's nothing to suggest inherently that being a Muslim mayor means he doesn't agree with gay rights. I have many gay Muslim friends. Clearly, they agree with their own existence. All right. it's not well, some, some would argue exclusive. they're not proper Muslims if they're gay, because by, yeah, by, by the Quran standards... Down, someone would say that Darren can't be Christian and gay, mm. right? Well, you know, that exists in different yeah. uh, walks You're of gay. life. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Can you believe? Can Only you believe? on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs>